Hello, I'm Janice Jackson, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. If fishing is your passion, then it's time for a trip to the Columbia River for the Spring Chinook Run. This is not a salmon fishing experience for the beginner, so you want to be sure to go with someone who knows what they're doing, and it will be much more enjoyable for you and maybe more successful too. When fishing the lower Columbia River for Spring Chinook, it would be recommended that you initially go with someone who has some experience at fishing it and can give you some tips on how this is done and some of the techniques that are used. What I'm doing now is tying a leader onto what's called a quick fish. And the quick fish, again, is fished uh, off the bottom. And basically what I do is do a, a double loop, four ties, four wraps around, and then back through the eye. This is called an improved clinch, and it's a knot that I use on virtually everything, and it works almost every time. That knot will never break. The next step would be to measure off about five feet of line, and I actually just use my arm's length as a measurement. Cut that and attach it to what's commonly known to us fishermen as a spreader bar. Spreader bar is commonly used to fish this type of fishery because it allows you to fish without getting tangled up and a lot of your line tied into each other. So just basically tie it onto the outer end of the spreader bar. Now that we have all of this, basically what we're going to do now, snap this to, to the end of the line on our pole, and off of this, we're going to come down to about 30 inches for our weight. And that's basically the setup for fishing the quick fish. Now what it's going to do is back in the water is move like this, and that is what attracts the fish. All right, so let's hook it up and give it a try. Fishing for Spring Chinook, even on days when the fishing is not that hot, it's still a great day out fishing and Spring Chinook fishing is just fun. Uh, it's just great to be outside and the Columbia River is an excellent, excellent place to uh, bring people to fish and to start out uh, new people fishing and it's, it's just fun. Well, the, the unique thing about these fish is, is they come back in uh, in the springtime and they don't spawn till fall time. So their their flesh quality is is excellent. They're, it's uh, very high in oil content at that time, and uh, which uh, makes them just a little bit richer flavor than than the fish to come back in the fall. I'd have to say it's one of the premium salmon of the world, um, other than maybe the sockeye we see here in the Columbia River that come back in uh, June and July. That uh, they're, they're excellent quality fish when they come back this time of year. Another gorgeous day fishing for Spring Chinook on the Lower Columbia River. Unfortunately, this was one of the days that we did not get any. Uh, but it was a gorgeous fishing day, and sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. Coming out here fishing for Spring Chinook, even on a day when you don't get fish, beats any day in the office. April is the month to update your Washington fishing license. This can be done either online at the agency's website or by visiting any of the hundreds of dealers across the state. Once you get that new license, here are some fishing opportunities during the coming weeks.
for our salmon resources has arrived in the form of over 100 acres of farmland in Pierce County. That farmland will be set aside to protect salmon habitat. It took several groups coming together to make this happen, and it will make a big difference for salmon production in the Puyallup watershed. Standing here on the bank of the South Prairie Creek and the England Dairy Site, recent land acquisition through Pierce Conservation District, South Prairie Creek is a host to every species of salmon that swims in the Puyallup and Carbon River that will actually come in here and spawn and would arguably be the heartbeat of the watershed. Uh, we've got Chinook, Coho, Pink Chum, Steelhead, and Cutthroat Trout that actually utilize this system. This property that we're standing on right now had it not been acquired by the Pierce Conservation District, would have otherwise been subject to development. We want to protect this stream from development, from excessive land use practices that would actually Im you know, impair the uh, water quality. Water quality, I say loosely, and that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And water quality out here, we're talking about temperatures, we're talking about fecal coliform le levels that are going to be much lower now that we've actually got dairy off of the South Prairie Creek area here and that we're actually going to be looking forward to planting the area with some more tree cover and riparian plantings. There's a host of wildlife that actually utilize the area. We've got eagles, we have hawks, we have a couple of herds of elk that move through the area as well as deer and coyote and raccoon. We saw some tracks this morning of some raccoon that are actually using the area and it's going to be a benefit to all the, the species that are already here. We've actually got some barn owls that utilize the, the barns that are on the site here that are going to remain in place. Barn owls are pretty important, control rodent populations quite well. South Prairie Creek was identified a long time ago as a very productive reach for salmon spawning and rearing. So that, that uh, established, documented the need to protect and restore here. Uh, as far as the partnership coming together, it was really just a convergence of a lot of different groups and agencies all wanting to do the right thing for the fish here and uh, just being in the right time at the right place and wanting to work together. The main South Prairie Creek and the two tributaries, one on the north side and the one on the south side, we're going to be planting 200 foot buffers. We estimate approximately 40,000 trees will be planted over the next two or three years. Um, and about 50 or 60 acres of reforestation. Um, and then there's the, the more active uses we're uh, looking into. We're working with the Native Plant Society and uh, different agencies to uh, possibly create a native plant nursery here. There's uh, farmers that would like to lease the fields that are gonna stay in operation. What we wanna do is to try to honor the uh, salmon, the agricultural history, and the native history kind of all at the same time. There needs to be more of this type of land acquisition that occurs, otherwise what makes Washington, Washington is going to go away fast. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife biologists have taken historic steps toward restoring our state's only native quail. It's called the mountain quail and it will be good to have them back. Today we're in the North Fork of Asotan Creek and we're releasing mountain quail or reintroducing mountain quail to this area where the population has declined dramatically from the original and very few sightings have occurred in the last 10 to 15 years so we're trying to supplement the population or reintroduce and create a healthy population again. These birds came from southwest Oregon and we released 75 today. These quail are unique that they are the only native quail to Washington they are approximately 20 to 25 percent larger than the valley or California quail that people typically see. Their difference is mainly in the body size. The two vertical phyla plumes on top of their head, which often appear as just one, but they'll stick straight up about two, two and a half inches, and they'll have vertical barring on their sides. The release today brought a new sound back to Asotan Creek. This is the first time that most people have heard the mountain quail in these drainages in their career. The cause of the decline of the mountain quail is really unknown. Most evidence is circumstantial, but habitat degradation is thought to be the major contributor. These birds are very secretive. They prefer to be in thick habitat, brushy habitat. They like conifer coverage, but they also like to be in riparian areas down near water. 
the birds tend to avoid flying from predators and or people and will run into the brush. The birds are very difficult to see for the most part and hearing them is the most common detection form. The night before the release we went to the holding facility with eight people. We placed collars on the animals. We took blood to determine the sex. The sex of the birds cannot be determined by their physical plumage so blood was needed to ta be taken. We once we placed the collars on them and, and weighed them, we placed them in the crates to be transported to this location today. For approximately six months from the date of release, when the radio collar batteries will die, they'll be looking at movements, survival patterns, uh, reproductive patterns, whether they're successful in raising chicks and how successful the release has been. Predominantly where the birds are going to go and whether we are introducing them into habitat that they will be successful in. Here's where you can see some of Washington's wildlife during the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.